Chapter 8 Central Bank of the World The optimum currency area is the world. Robert A. Mundell, recipient, Nobel Prize in Economics. I haven't read the governor's proposal, but as I understand, it's a proposal designed to increase the use of the IMF special drawing rights. Uh, and, um, we're actually quite open to that. Timothy Geithner, U.S. Treasury Secretary, in reply to a reporter's question about a Chinese government proposal. March 25th, 2009. The IMF has refined, repurposed, and restocked its toolkit. Christine Lagarde, IMF Managing Director, September 19th, 2013. One World To meet Dr. Min Ju is to see the future of global finance. He stands out in a crowd, his six-foot-four-inch frame reminding financiers of the late 20th century's most powerful bankers, Paul Volcker and Walter Riston, who dominated a room not just with intellect but with physical presence. Min Ju belongs not to the 20th century but to the 21st, and it's difficult to name anyone who better personifies the conflicting forces, East versus West, gold versus paper, state versus markets, coursing through the world today. Minju is the IMF's deputy managing director, among the most senior positions in the IMF, reporting directly to the managing director, Christine Lagarde. The IMF is one of the key institutions established at the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference, which created the framework for the international monetary system in the aftermath of the Great Depression as the Second World War drew to a close. Since its founding, the IMF has been the great enigma of global finance. The IMF is quite public about its operations and objectives. At the same time, it is little understood even by experts, in part because of the unique role it performs and the highly technical jargon it uses in doing so. Specialized university training at institutions like the School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C., is a typical admission ticket to a position at the IMF. This combination of openness and opaqueness is disarming. The IMF is transparently non-transparent. The IMF's mission has repeatedly morphed over the decades since Bretton Woods, In the 1950s and 1960s, it was the caretaker of the fixed exchange rate gold standard and a swing lender to countries experiencing balance of payments difficulties. In the 1970s, it was a forum for the transition from the gold standard to floating exchange rates, engaging in massive sales of gold at U.S. insistence to help suppress the price. In the 1980s and 1990s, the IMF was like a doctor who made house calls, dispensing bad medicine in the form of incompetent advice to emerging economies. This role ended abruptly with blood in the streets of Jakarta and Seoul, and scores killed as a result of the IMF's mishandling of the 1997-98 global financial crisis. The early 2000s were a period of drift, during which the IMF's mandate was unclear, An expert suggested that the institution had outlived its usefulness. The IMF re-emerged in 2008 as the de facto secretariat and operating arm of the G20, coordinating policy responses to the financial panic that year. Today, the IMF has capitalized on its newfound role as global lender of last resort. It has become the central bank of the world. Min Zhu holds the highest-ranking position ever held by a Chinese citizen at the IMF, the World Bank, or the Bank for International Settlements, the International Monetary System's three multilateral pillars. His career personifies China's financial rise in Nuche. He graduated in 1982 from Fudan University in Shanghai, among the most prestigious schools in China. He obtained a Ph.D. in economics in the United States before moving through various jobs at the World Bank and the International Division of the Bank of China. In 2009, he became China's central bank deputy governor. In May 2010, he was handpicked by Dominique Strauss-Kahn, then IMF chief, to be his special advisor.
Finally, in 2011, Strauss-Kahn's successor, Christine Lagarde, selected him to be the IMF's deputy managing director. Jew has a relaxed demeanor and a good sense of humor. But when pressed hard on a policy he feels strongly about, he can suddenly turn strident, as if he were lecturing students rather than engaging in debate. His slightly accented English is excellent, but his soft-spoken style is difficult to hear at times. His background is unique. He has operated at the highest levels at a central bank under Chinese Communist Party control and at the highest levels of the IMF, an institution ostensibly committed to free markets and open capital accounts. Zhu travels continually on official IMF business, for university lectures, and to attend prestigious international conferences such as the Davos World Economic Forum. Private bankers and government officials eagerly seek his advice at the IMF's Washington, D.C. headquarters and on the sidelines of G20 summits, while Communist Party Central Politburo members do the same on his periodic trips to Beijing. From east to west, from communism to capitalism, Min Zhu straddles the contending forces in world finance today with a foot in both camps. No one, including central bank governors and Madame Lagarde herself, is more aware than Zhu of the international monetary system's hidden truths, which makes his global economic and financial views especially significant. He is an adamant globalist, reflecting his position between the worlds of state capitalism and free markets. He does not think of the world in traditional categories of north-south or east-west, but rather as country clusters based on economic factors, supply chain linkages, and historical bonds. These clusters intersect and overlap. For example, Austria belongs to a European manufacturing cluster that includes Germany and Italy, but it's also part of a central European clutch of former Austro-Hungarian Empire nations, including Hungary and Slovenia. As that group's leader, Austria is a gatekeeper that gives the Austro-Hungarian group access to the European manufacturing cluster through a nexus of subcontracting, supply chains, and bank lending. These linkages might, for example, facilitate sales by a Slovenian auto parts manufacturer to Fiat in Italy. The Slovenian-Italian link runs through gatekeeper Austria. This paradigm of clusters Overlaps and gatekeepers results in unexpected alignments. Zhu places South America in a China Western Hemisphere supply chain cluster, a point also made by Rorden Rett, a leading scholar of Latin American economics. Zhu's view is that U.S. economic hegemony stops at the Panama Canal, while most of South America is now properly regarded as a Chinese sphere of influence. Jew's cluster paradigm is of more than academic interest because it is beginning to have a direct impact on IMF policy as it relates to surveillance of its 188 member countries. The paradigm provides a basis for the study of national policy spillover effects, as labeled by the IMF. The IMF treats spillovers in the same way that bank risk managers talk about contagion. The rapid uncontrolled transmission of collapse from one market to another through a dense web of counterparty obligations and collateral pledges in a blind stampede for liquidity in a financial panic. Spillovers happen within clusters when national economies are tightly linked and between clusters when gatekeepers are in distress. Minju is helping the IMF to develop a working risk management model based on complexity, one that is far more advanced than those used by individual central banks or private financial institutions. Updating Keynes Jew is showing traditional Keynesians how their model of policy action, in conjunction with an individual or corporate response, is obsolete. This two-part action-response model must be modified to place financial intermediation between the policymaker and the economic agent. This distinction is illustrated as follows. Here is the classic Keynesian model. Fiscal and monetary policy is greater than individual and corporate response. And here is the new IMF model. Fiscal monetary policy is greater than financial intermediary, which is greater than individual corporate response. 
While financial institutions in earlier decades had been predictable and passive players in policy transmission to individual economic actors, today's financial intermediaries are more active and materially mute or amplify policymakers' wishes. Private banks may use securitization, derivatives, and other forms of leverage to greatly increase the impact of policy easing, and they can tighten lending standards or migrate to safe assets like U.S. Treasury notes to diminish the impact. Banks are also the main transmission channels for spillover effects. Jew makes the point that Keynesian analysis fails in part because it has not fully incorporated the role of banks into its functions. Clustering, spillover, and financial transmission are the three theoretical legs supporting the platform from which the IMF surveys the international monetary system. New concepts of this kind can percolate in university economics departments for decades before they have practical effect. Despite a preponderance of PhDs in its ranks, the IMF is not a university. It is a powerful institution with the ability either to preserve or condemn regimes through its policy decisions on lending and the conditionality attached. Jew's paradigm offers a glimpse of the IMF's plans. Clustering implies that economic linkages are more important than sovereignty. Spillover effects mean top-down control is needed to contain risk. Financial transmission suggests that banks are the key nodes in the exercise of control. In a nutshell, the IMF seeks to control finance, to contain risk, and to condition economic development on a global basis. This one-world mission requires assistance from the most talented and politically powerful players available. The IMF executive suite is an exquisitely balanced microcosm of the global economy. In addition to Min Zhu and Managing Director Christine Lagarde, the IMF top management includes David Lipton from the United States, Naoyuki Shinohara from Japan, and Namat Shafik from Egypt. Group diversity is more than an exercise in multinationalism. Lagarde represents the European interest, Minju the Chinese, Lipton the American, Shinohara the Japanese, and Shafik the developing economies. The top five managers at the IMF, seated around a conference table, effectively speak for the world. David Lipton's is the single most powerful voice, more powerful than Christine Lagarde's, because the United States has a veto over all important actions by the IMF. This doesn't mean Lipton doesn't play for the team. On many issues, the United States and the IMF see eye to eye, including the dollar's eventual replacement as the global reserve currency. Lipton's veto power means that changes will take place at a tempo dictated by any quid pro quo that the United States demands. Lipton is one of numerous Robert Rubin protégés, who include Timothy Geithner, Jack Lew, Michael Froman, Larry Summers, and Gary Gensler. These men have for years controlled U.S. economic strategy in the international arena. Robert Rubin was Treasury Secretary from 1995 to 1999 after having worked several years in the Clinton White House as National Economic Council Director. Before joining the U.S. government, Rubin was Goldman Sachs co-chairman. He worked at Citigroup in the chairman's office from 1999 to 2009, and he briefly served as Citigroup chairman at the start of the financial markets collapse in 2007. Lipton, Froman, Geithner, Summers, and Gensler all worked for Rubin at the U.S. Treasury in the late 1990s. Liu at the White House, Lipton, Liu, and Froman later followed Rubin to Citigroup, while Summers later worked as a Citigroup consultant. After being vetted and groomed in mid-level positions in the 1990s, this bland, bureaucratic team was carefully placed and promoted within the White House, Treasury, IMF, and elsewhere in the 2000s to ensure Rubin's web of influence and role as the de facto godfather of global finance. Geithner is the former Treasury Secretary and former President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Liu currently holds the Treasury Secretary position. Froman was a powerful behind-the-scenes figure in the White House National Economic Council and National Security Council 
from 2009 through 2013, and then the U.S. Trade Representative. Larry Summers is a former Treasury Secretary and chaired President Obama's National Economic Council. During his White House years, Froman was the U.S. Sherpa at G20 meetings, sometimes seen whispering in the president's ear just as a key policy dispute was about to be ironed out with Chinese President Hu Jintao or another world leader. From 2009 through 2013, Gensler was chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the agency that regulates treasury bond and gold futures trading. The members of the Rubin clique are extraordinary in the incompetence they displayed during their years in public and private service and in the financial devastation they left in their wake. Rubin and his subordinate and successor, Larry Summers, promoted the two most financially destructive legislative changes in the past century. Glass-Steagall repeal in 1999, which allowed banks to operate like hedge funds, and derivatives regulation repeal in 2000, which opened the door to massive hidden leverage by banks. Geithner, while at the New York Fed from 2003 to 2008, was oblivious to the unsafe and unsound banking practices under his direct supervision, which led to the subprime mortgage collapse in 2007 and the panic of 2008. Froman, Lipton, and Liu were all at Citigroup along with Rubin and contributed to catastrophic failures in risk management that led to the once proud bank's collapse and its takeover by the U.S. government in 2008 with over 50,000 jobs lost at Citigroup alone. Gensler was instrumental in the 2002 passage of Sarbanes-Oxley legislation, which has done much to stifle capital formation and job creation in the years since. He was also on watch at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission in 2012 during the catastrophic collapse of MF Global, a bond and gold broker. Recently, Gensler has shown better sense calling for tougher derivatives regulation. The lost wealth and personal hardship resulting from the Rubin Click's policies are incalculable, yet their economic influence continues unabated. Today, Rubin still mines the global store from his seat as co-chairman of the nonprofit Council on Foreign Relations. David Lipton, the Rubin protege par excellence, with the lowest public profile of the group, is now powerfully placed in the IMF executive suite at a critical juncture in the international financial system's evolution. The Rubin Web of Influence is not a conspiracy. True conspiracies rarely involve more than a few individuals because they continually run the risk of betrayal, disclosure, or blunders. A large group like the Rubin clique actually welcomes conspiracy claims because they are easy to rebut, allowing the insiders to get back to work in the quiet, quasi-anonymous way they prefer. The Rubin Web is more a fuzzy network of like-minded individuals with a shared belief in the superiority of elite thought and with faith in their coterie's capacity to act in the world's best interests. They exercise global control not in the blunt, violent manner of Hitler, Stalin, or Mao, but in the penumbra of institutions like the IMF, behind a veneer of bland names and benign mission statements. In fact, the IMF's ability to topple a regime by withholding finance in a crisis is no less real than the power of Stalin's KGB or Mao's Red Guards. The executive team at the IMF holds the view, more gimlet-eyed than any central banks, that the international money system is severely impaired. Because of massive money printing since 2008, a new collapse could emerge at any time, playing out not just with failures of financial institutions or sovereigns, but with a loss of confidence in the U.S. dollar itself. Institutional memory reaches back to the dollar crash of October 1978, reversed only with Fed Chairman Paul Volcker's strong dollar policies beginning in August 1979 and IMF issuance of its world money, the Special Drawing Right, or SDR, in stages from 1979 to 1981. The dollar gained strength in the decades that followed, but the IMF learned how fragile confidence in the dollar could be when U.S. policy was negligently managed. Minju sees these risks as well even though he was a college student during the last dollar collapse. 
He knows that if the dollar collapses again, China has by far the most to lose, given its role as the world's largest external holder of U.S. dollar-denominated debt. Zhu believes the world is in a true depression, the worst since the 1930s. He is characteristically blunt about the reasons for it. He says the problems in developed economies are not cyclical, they are structural. Economists publicly disagree about whether the current economic malaise is cyclical or structural. A cyclical downturn is viewed as temporary, a phase that can be remedied with stimulus spending of the classic Keynesian kind. A structural downturn, by contrast, is embedded and lasts indefinitely unless adjustments in key factors, such as labor costs, labor mobility, taxes, regulatory burdens, and other public policies, are made. In the United States, the Federal Reserve and Congress have acted as if the U.S. output gap, the difference between potential and actual growth, is temporary and cyclical. This reasoning suits most policymakers and politicians because it avoids the need to make hard decisions about public policy. Zhu cuts through this myopia. Central bankers like to say the problem is mostly cyclical and partly structural, he recently said. I say to them it's mostly structural and partly cyclical, but actually, it's structural. The implication is that the structural problem requires structural, not monetary, solutions. The IMF is currently confronted with a full plate of contradictions. IMF economists, such as Jose Vinales, have warned repeatedly about excessive risk-taking by banks, but the IMF has no regulatory authority over banks in its member countries. Anemic global growth gives rise to calls for stimulus-style policies, but stimulus will not work in the face of structural impediments to growth. Any stimulus effect requires more government spending, but spending involves more debt at a time when sovereign debt crises are acute. Christine Lagarde calls for short-term stimulus combined with long-term fiscal consolidation, but markets don't trust politicians' long-term commitments. There is scant appetite for benefit cuts, even by countries on the brink of collapse like Greece. Proposed solutions are all either politically infeasible or economically dubious. Menjou's new paradigm points the way out of this bind. His clustering and gatekeeper analysis suggests that policies should be global, not national, and his spillover analysis suggests that more direct global bank regulation is needed to contain crises. The specter of the sovereign debt crisis suggests the urgency for new liquidity sources, bigger than those that central banks can provide, the next time a liquidity crisis strikes. The logic leads quickly from one world to one bank to one currency for the planet. The combination of Christine Lagarde's charismatic leadership, Minju's new paradigm, and David Lipton's opaque power have positioned the IMF for its greatest role yet. One Bank The Federal Reserve's status as a central bank has long been obvious, but in its origins from 1909 to 1913, Following the Panic of 1907, supporters went to great lengths to disguise the fact that the proposed institution was a central bank. The most conspicuous part of this exercise is the name itself, the Federal Reserve. It is not called the Bank of the United States of America, as the Bank of England or the Bank of Japan proclaim themselves, nor does the name contain the key phrase, central bank, in the style of the European Central Bank. Obfuscation was much by design. The American people had rejected central banks twice before. The original central bank, the Bank of the United States, chartered by Congress in 1791, was closed in 1811 after its 20-year charter expired. A second bank of the United States, also a central bank, existed from 1817 to 1836, but its charter was also allowed to expire in the midst of an acrimonious debate between supporters and opponents. From 1836 to 1913, a period of great prosperity and invention, the United States had no central bank. Well aware of this history and the American people's deep suspicion of central banks, the Federal Reserve's architects, principally Senator Nelson Aldrich of Rhode Island, 
were careful to disguise their intentions by adopting an anodyne name. Likewise, the IMF is best understood as a de facto central bank of the world, despite the fact that the phrase central bank does not appear in its name. The test of central bank status is not the name, but the purpose. A central bank has three primary roles. It employs leverage, it makes loans, and it creates money. Its ability to perform these functions allows it to act as a lender of last resort in a crisis. Since 2008, the IMF has been doing all three in a rapidly expanding way. A key difference between a central bank and ordinary banks is that a central bank performs these three functions for other banks rather than for public customers, such as individuals and corporations. Buried in the IMF's Articles of Agreement, its 123-page governing document, is a provision that states, Each member shall deal with the fund only through its central bank or other similar fiscal agency, and the fund shall deal only with or through the same agencies. According to its charter, then, the IMF is to function as the world's central bank, a fact carefully disguised by nomenclature and by the pose of IMF officials as mere international bureaucrats dispensing dispassionate technical assistance to nations in need. The IMF's central bank-style lending role is the easiest to discern of its functions. It has been the IMF's mission from its beginnings in the late 1940s and is one still trumpeted today. This function grew at a time when major currencies had fixed exchange rates to the dollar and when countries had closed capital accounts. When trade deficits or capital flight arose, causing balance of payment problems, countries could not resort to a devaluation quick fix unless they could show the IMF that the problems were structural and persistent. In those cases, the IMF might approve devaluation. More typically, the IMF acted as a swing lender, providing liquidity to the deficit country for a time, typically three to five years, in order for that country to make policy changes necessary to improve its export competitiveness. The IMF functioned for national economies, the way a credit card works for an individual who temporarily needs to borrow for expenses but plans to repay from a future paycheck. Structural changes required by the IMF in exchange for the loan might include labor market reforms, fiscal discipline to reduce inflation, or lower unit labor costs, all aimed at making the country more competitive in world markets. Once the adjustments took hold, the deficits would then turn to surpluses and the IMF loans would be repaid. However, that theory seldom worked smoothly in practice, and as trade deficits, budget deficits, and inflation persisted in certain member nations, devaluations were permitted. While devaluation can improve competitiveness, it can also impose large losses on investors in local markets who relied on attractive exchange rates to the dollar to make their initial investments. On the other hand, if it so chooses, the IMF can make loans to help countries avoid devaluation and thereby protect investors such as J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, and their favorite clients. Today, the IMF website touts loans to countries such as Yemen, Kosovo, and Jamaica as examples of its positive role in economic development. But such loans are window dressing, and the amounts are trivial compared to the IMF's primary lending operation, which is to prop up the euro. As of May 2013, 45% of all IMF loans and commitments were extended to just four countries. Ireland, Portugal, Greece, and Cyprus, as part of the Euro bailout. Another 46% of loans and commitments were extended to just two other countries, Mexico, whose stability is essential to the United States, and Poland, whose stability is essential to both NATO and the EU. Less than 10% of all IMF lending was to the neediest economies in Asia, Africa, or South America. Casual visitors to the IMF's website should not be deceived by images of smiling, dark-skinned women wearing native dress. The IMF functions as a rich nations club 
lending to support those nations' economic interests. If the IMF central bank lending function is transparent, its deposit-taking function is more opaque. The IMF does not function like a retail commercial bank with teller windows, where individuals can walk up and make a deposit to a checking or savings account. Instead, it runs a highly sophisticated asset liability management program, in which lending facilities are financed through a combination of quotas and borrowing arrangements. The quotas are similar to bank capital, and the borrowing arrangements are similar to the bonds and deposits that a normal bank uses to fund its lending. The IMF's financial activities are mostly conducted off-balance sheet as contingent lending and borrowing facilities. In this way, the IMF resembles a modern commercial bank, such as J.P. Morgan Chase, whose off-balance sheet contingent liabilities dwarf those shown on the balance sheet. To see the IMF's true financial position, one must look beyond the balance sheet to the footnotes and other sources. IMF financial reports are stated in its own currency, the SDR, which is easily converted into dollars. The IMF computes and publishes the SDR to dollar exchange rate daily. In May 2013, the IMF had almost $600 billion of unused borrowing capacity, which when combined with existing resources, gave the IMF $750 billion in lending capacity. If this borrowing and lending capacity were fully utilized, the IMF's leverage ratio would only be about 3 to 1, if quotas were considered to be equity. This is extremely conservative compared to most major banks whose leverage ratios are closer to 20 to 1, and are higher still when hidden off-balance sheet items are considered. The interesting aspect of IMF leverage is not that it is high today, but that it exists at all. The IMF operated for decades with almost no leverage. Advances were made from members' quotas. The idea was that members would contribute their quota to a pool, and individual members could draw from the pool for temporary relief as needed. As long as total borrowings did not exceed the total quota pool, the system was stable and did not need leverage. This is no longer the case. As corporations and individuals deleveraged after the panic of 2008, sovereign governments, central banks, and the IMF have employed leverage to keep the global monetary system afloat. In effect, public debt has replaced private debt. The overall debt burden has not been reduced. It has increased as the global debt problem has been moved upstairs. The IMF is the penthouse, where the problem can be passed no higher. So far, the IMF has been able to facilitate the official leveraging process as an offset to private deleveraging. Public leverage has mostly occurred at the level of national central banks, such as the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Japan, but as those central banks reach practical and political limits on their leverage, the IMF will emerge as the last lender of last resort. In the next global liquidity crisis, the IMF will have the only clean balance sheet in the world because national central bank balance sheets are over-leveraged with long-duration assets. The biggest single boost to the IMF's borrowing and leverage capacity came on April 2, 2009, very near the depths of the stock market crashes that began in 2008, a time of pervasive fear in financial markets. The occasion was the G20 Leaders Summit in London, hosted by the UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown and attended by US President Obama, French President Sarkozy, German Chancellor Merkel, China's Hu Jintao, and other world leaders. The summit pledged to expand the IMF's lending capacity to $750 billion. For every dollar the IMF lends, it must first obtain a dollar from its members. So, expanded lending capacity implied expanded borrowing and greater leverage. It took the IMF over a year to obtain most of the needed commitments, although, for a panoply of political reasons, the full amount has not yet been subscribed. 
The largest IMF commitments came from the European Union and Japan, each committing $100 billion, and China, which committed another $50 billion. Other large commitments of $10 billion each came from other BRIC nations, Russia, India, and Brazil, and from the developed nations of Canada, Switzerland, and Korea. The most contentious commitment to the IMF's new borrowing facility involved the United States. On April 16, 2009, just days after the G20 summit, President Obama sent letters to the congressional leadership requesting its support for a $100 billion commitment to the new IMF borrowings. The president, guided by Ruben protege Mike Froman, had made a verbal pledge of the $100 billion at the summit, but he needed legislation to deliver on the actual funding. The letters to Congress stated that the new funding was a package deal intended to increase IMF votes for China and to force gold sales by the IMF. President Obama's letter also called for a special one-time allocation of special drawing rights, reserve assets created by the IMF that will increase global liquidity. The president's letters were refreshingly candid on the IMF's ability to print world money. China wanted additional votes at the IMF and wanted more gold dumped on the market to avoid a run-up in the price at a time when it was acquiring gold covertly. The United States wanted the IMF to print more world money. The IMF wanted hard currency from the United States and China to conduct bailouts. The deal, which had something for everyone, had been carefully structured by Mike Froman and other Sherpas at the summit, and signed on by Geithner, Obama, and the G20 leaders. Looking a bit deeper, the Obama letter to Congress contained another twist. The new commitments to the IMF came not as quotas, but as loans, consistent with the IMF's growing role as a leveraged bank. The president sought to reassure Congress that the loan to the IMF was not an expenditure and therefore would have no impact on the U.S. budget deficit. The president's letter said, That is because when the United States transfers dollars to the IMF, the United States receives in exchange a liquid interest-bearing claim on the IMF, which is backed by the IMF's strong financial position, including gold. This statement is entirely true. The IMF does have a strong financial position, and it has the third largest gold hoard in the world after the United States and Germany. It was curious that just as Federal Reserve officials were publicly disparaging gold's role in the monetary system, the president felt the need to mention gold to the Congress as a confidence booster. Despite disparagement of gold by academics and central bankers, gold has never fully lost its place as the bedrock of global finance. Drilling still further down, we find a curious feature of the IMF loan proposal. If the United States gave the IMF $100 billion in cash, it would receive an interest-bearing note from the IMF in exchange. However, the note would be denominated not in dollars, but in SDRs. Since the SDR is a non-dollar world currency, its value fluctuates against the U.S. dollar. The SDR exchange value is calculated partly by reference to the dollar, but also by reference to a currency basket that includes the Japanese yen, the euro, and the UK pound sterling. This means that when the IMF note matures, the United States will receive back not the original $100 billion, but a different amount depending on the fluctuation of the dollar against the SDR. If the dollar were to grow stronger against the other currencies in the SDR basket, the United States would receive less than the original $100 billion loan in repayment because the non-dollar basket components would be worth less. But if the dollar were to grow weaker against the other currencies in the SDR basket, the United States would receive more than the original $100 billion loan in repayment because the non-dollar basket components would be worth more. In making the loan, the U.S. Treasury is betting against the dollar, since only a decline in the dollar would enable the United States to get its money back. 
This $100 billion bet against the dollar was not mentioned in the president's letter and went largely unrecognized by Congress at the time. As it happens, it proved a political time bomb that came back to haunt the United States and the IMF ahead of the 2012 presidential election. The president's letters also misled Congress about the loan commitment's purpose. They state in several places that the loan proceeds would be used by the IMF for assistance primarily to developing and emerging market countries. In fact, the IMF's new borrowing capacity was used primarily to bail out the Eurozone members, Ireland, Portugal, Greece, and Cyprus. Little of the cash was used for emerging markets lending. The misleading language was intended to dodge criticism from Congress that U.S. taxpayer money would be used to bail out Greek bureaucrats who retired at age 50 with lifetime pensions, while Americans were working past 70 to make ends meet. These deceptions and the Treasury's bet against the dollar went unnoticed in the frenzy of auto company bailouts and stimulus packages. Under the leadership of House Democrat Barney Frank and Senate Republican Richard Lugar, the U.S. commitment to the IMF borrowings was buried in a war spending bill and was passed by Congress on June 16, 2009. The IMF issued a press release with remarks by then-managing director Dominique Strauss-Kahn touting the legislation and describing it as a significant step forward. While the legislation provided for the $100 billion U.S. commitment, the IMF did not actually borrow the funds right away. The commitment was like a credit line on a MasterCard that the cardholder has not yet used. The IMF could swipe the MasterCard at any time and get the $100 billion from the United States simply by issuing a borrowing notice. In November 2010, the Obama plan to finance IMF bailouts had the rug pulled out from under it by the midterm elections and the Republican takeover of the House of Representatives. Republican success was fueled by Tea Party resentment at earlier bailouts for Wall Street banks, Goldman Sachs, and J.P. Morgan Chase. Barney Frank lost his House Financial Services Committee chairmanship, and the new Republican leadership began examining the implications of the U.S. commitment to the IMF. By early 2011, the European sovereign debt crisis had reached a critical state, and it was impossible to disguise the fact that U.S. funds, if drawn by the IMF, would be used to bail out retired Greek and Portuguese bureaucrats. Conservative publications featured headlines like, Why is the U.S. bankrolling IMF's bailouts in Europe? On November 28, 2011, Barney Frank announced his retirement. Also in 2011, Senator Jim DeMint, Republican South Carolina, introduced legislation to rescind the U.S. commitment to the IMF. The DeMint bill was defeated by the Senate on a 55-45 to 45 vote. That defeat needed votes from Republicans, which were provided by Richard Lugar, Republican, Indiana, and a few others. On May 8, 2012, the Tea Party struck back by supporting Richard Murdoch, who went on to defeat Lugar in a primary election, forcing Lugar's retirement after 36 years as a senator. One by one, the IMF's friends in the U.S. Congress were stepping aside or being forced out. With regard to the Frank and Luger departures from Congress, the IMF's Lagarde gave a Gallic shrug and said, We will miss them. By late 2013, the sparring match between the White House and Congress over funding for the IMF had grown more intense. After the London G20 summit, the IMF had taken further steps to increase its borrowing power beyond the original commitments, shifting some of the U.S. lending commitment away from debt toward a quota increase. In effect, it moved part of the U.S. money from temporary lending to permanent capital. These 2010 changes, which also followed through on the London summit commitments to increase the voting power of China, required congressional approval beyond that contained in the 2009 Barney Frank legislation. Hundreds of eminent international economists, and prominent former officials such as Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, who had engineered the Goldman Sachs bailout in 2008, publicly called on Congress to approve the legislation. However, 
President Obama did not include the new requests in his 2012 or 2013 budgets in order to avoid making a campaign issue out of U.S. taxpayer support for European bailouts. At this point, Christine Lagarde's impatience with the process began to boil over. During the World Economic Forum in Davos on January 28, 2012, she hoisted her Louis Vuitton handbag in the air and said, I am here with my little bag to actually collect a bit of money. In an interview with the Washington Post published on June 29, 2013, she was more pointed and said, We have been able to significantly increase our resources, notwithstanding the fact that the U.S. did not contribute or support that move. I think everybody would like to complete the process. Let's face it, it has been around a long time. Fortunately for the IMF, the controversial U.S. funds commitment was not needed in the short run. By late 2012, the European sovereign debt crisis had stabilized, as growth continued in the United States and China, albeit at a slower rate than hoped for by the IMF. But after the history of debt crises in Dubai, Greece, Cyprus, and elsewhere from 2009 to 2013, it appeared to be just a matter of time before the situation somewhere destabilized, and the U.S. commitment would be needed to finance another rescue package. The IMF's role as a leveraged lender, in effect, a bank, is now institutionalized. The IMF has evolved from a quota-based swing lender to a leveraged lender of last resort, like the Federal Reserve. Its borrowing and lending capabilities are well understood by economic experts, if not by the public at large. But even experts are largely unfamiliar with or confused by the IMF's greatest power, the ability to create money. Indeed, the name of the IMF's world money, the special drawing right, seems designed more to confuse than to enlighten. The IMF's printing press is standing by, ready for use when needed in the next global liquidity crisis. It will be a key tool in engineering the dollar's demise. One Currency John Maynard Keynes once mused that not one man in a million was able to understand the process by which inflation destroys wealth. It is as likely that not one woman or man in ten million understands special drawing rights, or SDRs. Still, the SDR is poised to be an inflationary precursor par excellence. The SDR's mix of opacity and unaccountability permits global monetary elites to solve sovereign debt problems using an inflationary medium, which in turn allows individual governments to deny political responsibility. The SDR's stealth qualities begin with its name, like Federal Reserve and International Monetary Fund. The name was chosen to hide its true purpose. Just as the Federal Reserve and IMF are central banks with disguised names, so the SDR is world money in disguise. Some monetary scholars, notably Barry Eichengreen of the University of California at Berkeley, object to the use of the term money as applied to SDRs, viewing the units as a mere accounting device used to shift reserves among members. But the IMF's own financial reports refute this view. Its annual report contains the following disclosures. The SDR may be allocated by the IMF as a supplement to existing reserve assets. Its value as a reserve asset derives from the commitments of participants to hold and accept SDRs. The SDR is also used by a number of international and regional organizations as a unit of account. Participants and prescribed holders can use and receive SDRs in transactions among themselves. As money is classically defined as having three essential qualities, store of value, unit of account, and medium of exchange, this disclosure clinches the case for the SDR as money. The IMF itself says the SDR has value, is a unit of account, and can be used as a medium of exchange in transactions among designated holders. The three-part money definition is satisfied in full. The amount of SDRs in circulation is minuscule compared to national 
and regional currencies such as the dollar and euro. The SDR's use is limited to IMF members and certain other official institutions and is controlled by the IMF Special Drawing Rights Department. Further, SDRs will perhaps never be issued in banknote form and may never be used on an everyday basis by citizens around the world, but even such limited usage does not alter the fact that the SDR is world money controlled by elites. In fact, it enhances that role by making the SDR invisible to citizens. The SDR can be issued in abundance to IMF members and can also be used in the future for a select list of the most important transactions in the world, including balance of payment settlements, oil pricing, and financial accounts of the world's largest corporations, such as ExxonMobil, Toyota, and Royal Dutch Shell. Any inflation caused by massive SDR issuance would not immediately be apparent to citizens. The inflation would show up eventually in dollars, yen, and euros at the gas pump or the grocery, but national central banks could deny responsibility with ease and point a finger at the IMF. Since the IMF is not accountable to any electoral process and is a self-perpetuating supranational organization, the buck would stop nowhere. The SDR's history is as colorful as its expected future. It was not part of the original Bretton Woods monetary architecture agreed to in 1944. It was an emergency response to a dollar crisis that began in 1969 and continued, in stages, through 1981. During the Bretton Woods system's early decades, from 1945 to 1965, international monetary experts worried about a so-called dollar shortage. At that time, the dollar was the dominant global reserve currency, essential to international trade. Europe's and Japan's industrial bases had been devastated during the Second World War. Both Europe and Japan had human capital, but neither possessed the dollars or gold needed to pay for the machinery and raw materials that could revive their manufacturing. The dollar shortage was partly alleviated by Marshall Plan aid and Korean War spending, but the greatest boost came from the U.S. consumers' newfound appetite for high-quality, inexpensive, imported goods. American baby boomers, as teenagers in the 1960s, may recall driving to the beach in a Volkswagen Beetle with a Toshiba transistor radio in hand. By 1965, competitive export nations such as Germany and Japan were rapidly acquiring the two principal reserve assets at the time, dollars and gold. The United States understood that it needed to run substantial trade deficits to supply dollars to the rest of the world and facilitate world trade. The international monetary system soon fell victim to its own success. The dollar shortage was replaced with a dollar glut, and trading partners became uneasy with persistent U.S. trade deficits and potential inflation. This situation was an illustration of Triffin's dilemma, named after Belgian economist Robert Triffin, who first described it in the early 1960s. Triffin pointed out that when one nation issues the global reserve currency, it must run persistent trade deficits to supply that currency to its trading partners. But if the deficits persist too long, confidence in the currency will eventually be lost. Paradoxically, both a dollar shortage and a dollar glut give rise to consideration of alternative reserve assets. In the case of a dollar shortage, a new asset is sought to provide liquidity. In the case of a dollar glut, a new asset is sought to provide substitutes for investing reserves and to restore confidence. Either way, the IMF has long been involved in the contemplation of alternatives to the dollar. By the late 1960s, confidence in the dollar was collapsing due to a combination of U.S. trade deficits, budget deficits, and inflation brought on by President Lyndon Johnson's guns and butter policies. U.S. trading partners, notably France and Switzerland, began dumping dollars for gold. A full-scale run on Fort Knox commenced, and the U.S. gold hoard was dwindling at an alarming rate, leading to President Nixon's decision to end the dollar's gold convertibility on August 15, 1971. 
As caretaker of the international monetary system, the IMF confronted collapsing confidence in the dollar and a perceived gold shortage. The UK pound sterling had already devalued in 1967 and was suffering its own crisis of confidence. German marks were considered attractive, but German capital markets were far too small to provide global reserve assets in sufficient quantities. The dollar was weak, gold was scarce, and no alternative assets were available. The IMF feared that global liquidity could evaporate, triggering a collapse of world trade and a depression, as had happened in the 1930s. In this strained environment, the IMF decided in 1969 to create a new global reserve asset, the SDR from thin air. From the start, the SDR was world fiat money. Kenneth W. Dam, a leading monetary scholar and former senior U.S. government official who served in the Treasury, the White House, and Department of Defense, explains in his definitive history of the IMF, The SDR differed from nearly all prior proposals in one crucial respect. Previously, it had been thought essential that any new international reserves created through the fund, and particularly any new reserve asset, be backed by some other asset. The SDR, in contrast, was created out of, so to speak, whole cloth. It was simply allocated to participants in proportion to quotas, leading some to refer to the SDR as manna from heaven. Thereafter, it existed and was transferred without any backing at all. A ready analogy is to fiat money created by national governments but not convertible into underlying assets such as gold. Initially, the SDR was valued as equivalent to 0.888671 grams of fine gold, but this IMF gold standard was abandoned in 1973, not long after the United States itself abandoned the gold standard with respect to the dollar. Since 1973, the SDR's value has been computed with reference to a reserve currency basket. This does not mean that the SDR is backed by hard currencies, as Dan points out, merely that it has value in transactions and accounting is calculated in that manner. Today, the basket consists of dollars, euros, yen, and pounds sterling in specified weights. SDRs have been issued to IMF members on four occasions since their creation. The first issue was for 9.3 billion SDRs, handed out in stages from 1970 to 1972. The second issue was for 12.1 billion SDRs, also done in stages, from 1979 to 1981. There was no SDR issuance for almost 30 years, from 1981 to 2009. This was the King Dollar Era, engineered by Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan, which continued through the Republican and Democratic administrations of George Bush, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush. Then, in 2009, in the wake of the financial crisis and in the depths of a new depression, the IMF issued 161.2 billion SDRs on August 28th and 21.5 billion SDRs on September 9th. The cumulative SDR issuance since their creation is $204.1 billion, worth over $30 billion at the current dollar SDR exchange rate. The history makes it clear that there is a close correspondence between periods of SDR issuance and periods of collapsing confidence in the dollar. The best index of dollar strength or weakness is the price-adjusted broad dollar index, calculated and published by the Federal Reserve. The Fed's dollar index series begins in January 1973 and is based on a par value expressed as 100.00 on the index. The first SDRs issued in 1970 to 1972 predate this index, but were linked to the dollar's 20% collapse against gold at the time. The second SDR issuance from 1979 to 1981 immediately followed a dollar breakdown from a Fed index level of 94.2780 in March 1977 to 84.1326 in October 1978, an 11% decline in 19 months. In 
After the issuance, the dollar recovered its standing, and the index hit 103.2159 in March 1982. This was the beginning of the King Dollar period. The third and fourth SDR issuances began in August 2009, not long after the dollar crashed to an index level of 84.1730 in April 2008, near its level in the crisis of 1979. The lags of approximately a year between index lows and SDR issuance are a reflection of the time it takes the IMF to obtain board approval to proceed with new issuance. Unlike the issuance in the 1980s King Dollar period, the massive 2009 issuance did not result in the dollar regaining its strength. In fact, the dollar index reached an all-time low of 80.5178 in July 2011, just before gold hit an all-time high of $1,895 on September 5th. The difference in 2011 compared to 1982 was that the Fed and Treasury were pursuing a weak dollar policy, in contrast to Paul Volcker's strong dollar policy. Nevertheless, the 2009 SDR issuance served its purpose, reliquifying global financial markets after the panic of 2008. Markets regained their footing by late 2012 with the stabilization of the European sovereign debt crisis after Mario Draghi's whatever-it-takes pledge on the ECB's behalf. By 2012, global liquidity was restored, and SDRs were once again placed on the shelf, awaiting the next global liquidity crisis. Although the SDR is a useful tool for emergency liquidity creation, thus far the dollar retains its status as the world's leading reserve currency. Performing a reserve currency role requires more than just being money. It requires a pool of investable assets, primarily a deep, liquid bond market. Any currency can be used in international trade if the trading partners are willing to accept it as a medium of exchange. But a problem arises after one trading partner has acquired large trade currency balances, and that party needs to invest the balances in liquid assets that pay market returns and preserve value. When the balances are large, for example, China's $3 trillion in reserves, the investable asset pool must be correspondingly large. Today, U.S. dollar-denominated government bonds are the only markets in the world large and diversified enough to absorb the investment flows coming from surplus nations, such as China, Korea, and Taiwan. The SDR market is microscopic in comparison. Still, the IMF makes no secret of its ambitions to transform the SDR into a reserve currency that could replace the dollar. This was revealed in an IMF study released in January 2011, consisting of a multi-year, multi-step plan to position the SDR as the leading global reserve asset. The study recommends increasing the SDR supply to make them liquid and more attractive to potential private sector market participants such as Goldman Sachs and Citigroup. Importantly, the study recognizes the need for natural sellers of SDR-denominated bonds, such as Volkswagen and IBM. Sovereign wealth funds are recommended as the most likely SDR bond buyers for currency diversification reasons. The IMF study recommends that the SDR bond market replicate the infrastructure of the U.S. Treasury market with hedging, financing, settlement, and clearance mechanisms substantially similar to those used to support trading in Treasury securities today. Beyond the SDR bond market creation, the IMF blueprint goes on to suggest that the IMF could change the SDR basket composition to reduce the weight given to the U.S. dollar and increase the weights of other currencies, such as the Chinese yuan. This is a stealth mechanism to enhance the yuan's role as a reserve currency long before China itself has created a yuan bond market or opened its capital account. If the SDR market becomes liquid and the yuan is included in the SDR, bank dealers will discover ways to arbitrage one currency against the other and thereby increase the yuan's use and attractiveness. With regard to a future SDR bond market, the IMF study candidly concludes 
If there were political willingness to do so, these securities could constitute an embryo of global currency. This conclusion is highly significant because it's the first time the IMF has publicly moved beyond the idea of the SDR as a liquidity supplement and presented it as a leading form of world money. Indeed, the IMF's distribution of SDRs is not limited to IMF members. Article 17 of the IMF's Governing Articles of Agreement permits SDR issuance to non-members and other official entities, including the United States and the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS, in Basel, Switzerland. The BIS is notorious for facilitating Nazi gold swaps while being run by an American, Thomas McKittrick, during the Second World War, and is commonly known as the Central Bank for Central Banks. The IMF can issue SDRs to the BIS today to finance its ongoing gold market manipulations. Under Article 17 authority, the IMF could also issue SDRs to the United Nations, which could put them to use for population control or climate change regimes. An expanded role for SDRs awaits further developments that may take years to evolve. While the SDR is not ready to replace the dollar as the leading reserve currency, it is moving slowly in that direction. Still, the SDR's rapid response role as a liquidity source in a financial panic is well practiced. The 2009 SDR issuance can be viewed as a test drive prior to a much larger issuance and a future liquidity crisis. SDRs granted to an IMF member are not always immediately useful because that member may need to pay debts in dollars or euros. However, SDRs can be swapped for dollars with many other members who do not mind receiving them. The IMF has an internal SDR department that facilitates these swaps. For example, if Austria has obligations in Swiss francs and receives an SDR allocation, Austria can arrange to swap SDRs for dollars with China. Austria then sells the dollars for Swiss francs and uses the francs to meet its obligations. China will gladly take SDRs for dollars as a way to diversify its reserves out of dollars. In actual swaps, China had acquired the equivalent of $1.24 billion in SDRs above its formal allocations by April 30, 2012. IMF Deputy Managing Director Min Zhu cryptically summarized the SDR's liquidity role when he stated, They are fake money, but they are a kind of fake money that can be real money. The IMF is transparent when it comes to the purpose of SDR issuance. The entire Bretton Woods architecture, which gave rise to the IMF, was a reaction to the 1930s depression and deflation. The IMF Articles of Agreement address this issue explicitly. They state, In all its decisions with respect to the allocation of special drawing rights, the fund shall seek to meet the long-term global need, as and when it arises, to supplement existing reserve assets in such manner as will avoid deflation. Deflation is every central bank's nemesis because it is difficult to reverse, impossible to tax, and makes sovereign debt unpayable by increasing the value of debt. By explicitly acknowledging its mission to prevent deflation, the IMF's actions are consistent with the aims of other central banks. With its diverse leadership, leveraged balance sheet, and the SDR, the IMF is poised to realize its one-world, one-bank, one-currency vision and exercise its intended role as central bank of the world. The next global liquidity crisis will shake the stability of the international monetary system to its core. It may also be the catalyst for the realization of the IMF's vision. The SDR is the preferred pretender to the dollar's throne.